Hi everybody, this is David Paul, and I'm here with Sherlyn Marlowe. We're going to be talking about ORP basics today. So I'm sure you're aware Yokogawa is a huge company all over the world, been around since 1915, $3.7 billion company. Um, interesting, because I didn't know this, that active in industrial automation and control, as well as test and measurement and uh, many other business segments and you can also see that basically in any industrial market that you can think of. So Sherlyn is with Yokogawa, she'll be giving the bulk of the presentation today. I'm with Dave H. Paul Inc. We've been around for a long time doing training. We train uh, basically in any high-tech water treatment we have many different formats for training, so if you're interested, you can um, take a look at our website. We also do technical services. So we have um, co-hosted with Yokogawa five webinars, uh, and this will be over the next month or so. It's We schedule them for every two to three weeks, always at the same time. So we did the pH basics a couple of weeks ago. That's, pre, that's recorded, so you can go to our website and view that if you weren't able to attend. And today we're talking about ORP. So it'll be about a 45 minute presentation. I will give just a very brief intro and then Sherlyn will do the bulk of the webinar. And then we'll leave 10 to 15 minutes at the end for questions and answers. So just type your questions at any time into the question box. And this presentation will be recorded. Um, you'll be getting an email from us um, either tomorrow or the next uh, business day. And on that, we'll send you a PDF of this presentation and also the link to go to the recorded webinars, this one and previous one. So just so that you're aware, Yokogawa and David H. Paul Inc. do not have a financial relationship. Uh, we're not endorsing or promoting each other's products in this webinar. So we're presenting this webinar just as a service to the water treatment industry. And it certainly is a topic that I find fascinating as ORP is out there in the industry and it's one of, I think, the lesser known um, instruments that we have. So I'm looking forward to this uh, probably as much as you are. So for me, I've been um, in water treatment, high-tech water treatment since 1977 and have been around ORP for quite a few years, but there's still a lot to learn. Sherlyn with Yokogawa, Yokogawa is a process liquid analyzer product manager. She's been with them for nine years, uh, has some great experience and also education. At any time, you can input your questions, um, but we'll cover them at the very end. Any questions that we don't cover. So if we get to the end, it's time to quit and there's still some questions, you'll be, your questions will be answered by email and then we'll also add the questions and the answer to the recorded webinar. So that'll still be available um, after today. So just a real brief um, introduction to ORP. ORP stands for Oxidation Reduction potential, we're talking about oxidation or oxidizing. That's where we're taking electrons and the opposite of that, reduction or reducing, we're donating electrons. So an ORP meter, an ORP measurement uh, will tell us whether a water stream is reducing, it wants to give up electrons, or it's oxidizing, it wants to take electrons. Well. Chlorine in water, chlorine is an oxidizing agent, chlorine wants to take electrons and it may take those electrons from something we don't want them to take electrons from like an RO membrane. So uh, important, uh, if we have a chlorinated feed water in front of an RO unit, we have to dechlorinate so that we don't 
uh, destroy the RO membrane. So one way of doing it, one very common way of doing that is injecting either sodium bisulfite or sodium metabisulfite, some uh, chemical that will give us a sulfite uh, ion, which is the reducing agent that's going to donate the electrons and give it to the chlorine. Well, drinking water is chlorinated, so uh, this injection of sulfite um, is to protect the RO unit, and as an on-stream instrument that we can use to make sure that we are completely dechlorinated, we can put an ORP meter downstream a sulfite injection with a feedback uh, to the sulfite injection pump. So if the ORP is getting a little high, then the feedback to the pump will say, pump in some more sulfite. And then typically there's also a shutdown of the RO unit. There'll be an alarm, um, give you a few minutes to go check things out, and then if the uh, system is still in the alarm, then actually shut the RO unit down again to protect the membrane. So as Sherlyn will go over, we're talking about millivolts plus or minus. Um, it's sometimes a, a little bit of a, a challenge with the different waters to, to find out exactly where zero chlorine is. And most of the time we like to overfeed sulfite so that uh, we are just absolutely sure that uh, we don't have any kind of oxidation of the membrane going on. But sulfite can also, uh, excess sulfite can also cause some biofouling issues. So we want to get zero chlorine, but we want to get zero chlorine and just a little bit of an excess, maybe a half to one part per million of excess sulfite. So sometimes it takes a, a little bit of trial and error to find the uh, millivolt reading that's exactly right at your plant. So I'm just going to turn this over to Sherlyn now, and she will go through the bulk of this presentation, and then I'll come back and just say a few words when we hit the, the Q&A section. All right, thank you very much. Hi, everybody, going to show my screen real quick. Um, everybody should be able to see the PowerPoint presentation. So today we're going to go over the basics of ORP. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the theory to explain it a little more. Then we're going to go over some product selection, kind of the same format with the oh, I, um, that we did in the PA. Talk about how the ORP, the ORP probes are different than the pH probes. And then the bulk of it's going to be the maintenance because this is where we have found the most complications or discrepancies in understanding when it comes to ORP measurements. And then some other typical known applications that you may have in your plant. A bit of the so ORPation reduction potential measurements in a plant or in a process or pH, the common ones that we see are cooling towers for biocide um, growth, corrosion control. They also use ORP measurements to indicate, you know, the piping um, deterioration, water with disinfection, and then big one for wastewater. If you've got a plant that's got cyanide or chromium for electroplating, they have to go through two stages, and we'll talk about that at the end, of ORP reactions to make sure that the chromium and the cyanide that's, you know, exiting the plant is not of the toxic state that could actually kill kill us or kill fish or anim um, other animals. So this is where the fun part and the confusing part gets a little bit. ORP, another term besides oxidation re uh, reduction potential, is also called redox. The terms get a little confused because it sounds a little backwards, but one of the, um, you know, Things that kind of when you're growing up, you learn catchphrases on how to remember it. One of them is oil rig. Oxidation is law. I am the um, element. 
oxidation state. A little example for you guys. Let's look at the reaction between iron and copper sulfate. Two reactions that happen at the exact same time. The first reaction is what happens to the copper. Um, the copper element in this reaction is actually the oxidizing agent because it has the capability to, oh, I went too fast, I'm sorry, to accept those electrons. And it acquires them and it becomes reduced. Okay, so that is the second reaction is the iron and it's called the reducing agent because it's causing something else to be reduced. But it itself in this example is actually oxidized, oxidized because it has given up electrons and its oxidation state has become increased. So this is where the most confusion kind of comes again because the terms, they cross paths when you're talking about what type of reagent and what's actually going on. So oxidizing agents are actually reduced in the reaction because their, their oxidation number decreases. The reducing agent is actually oxidized. It gives up its electrons because its oxidation number actually increases within the um, equation or in the, you know, the chemistry that's going on. Let's take another look at another example real quick, because that's all fine and dandy, but how does it happen every day? Besides physical chemical processes that have reactions that take place, one that you may not think about happens every day. I love jewelry, okay? I think every person, every female at least, I'm a female obviously, loves jewelry. Let's look at sapphire. What gives sapphire crystals their actual blue color is actually an everyday reaction, oxidation reduction reaction when white light, pure light passes through the crystals and re reacts with the, an iron and can actually pass through and that's why crystals become the, you know, are the sapphires, are the blue colors. Um, so it's just an everyday reaction. So they have all the time. I'm hearing that we are seeing that we're having some problems with my audio. I don't know why it's cutting in and out. I hope it gets better. I am on a headset here. Sorry for that, you guys. But let's look at the um, similarities to pH and ORP, right? So both of these measurements are what we call electrochemical measurements. And traditionally, they normally use the exact same silver-silver chloride reference system. The difference is where we get into the actual measuring electrode itself. When you use ORP or when you're measuring just ORP, not a combination pH and ORP in the same probe, you actually have electrode that is made of what we call a noble metal. Traditionally, it's either going to be gold or it's going to be platinum. And though that metal actually responds to the oxidation, the reduction that happens in a um, process, but it also responds to hydrogen, anything that happens oxidation reduction rise on the hydrogen element. Whereas with a pH measuring glass, if we remember, it's physically designed so that it only reacts to the hydrogen ion activity. So it's very important to remember that when you're measuring ORP, it will be affected by P, uh, changes in pH. So we have to account for those in some map to know how you were seeing because of this pH. Okay, ORP is some, um, and that's why we want to look at it, but there's a pH scale that goes from 0 to 14, and it's 7 pH, or 0 millivolts, we call it neutral. And if it's uh, below 7, we call it acidic because it is capable of liberating hydrogen ions. And if it's basic, we call it, um, or if it's north of 7, you know, 7 to 14, we call it a basic or alkaline solution because it has the ability to, the solution has the ability to absorb hydrogen ions in it. If we look at ORP again, this little giving up and giving, accepting electrons, ORP can be looked at the same way. We are indicating the oxidation reduction status of a solution in total. So what activity is going on? It's kind of like conductivity as well. It's non-selective. So we're just looking at everything that's in there that's causing reaction of oxidation reduction and generating a millivolt, okay? 
there is a scale, just like ORP. I mean, just like pH, ORP has a scale. It normally goes from positive 1,500, which would be zero pH, to negative 1,500, which would be 14 pH, and zero in the middle is seven pH, it's neutral. Anything below that, we call it oxidizing. Anything above the zero, the neutral point, we call it more of a strongly reducing. It's the same thing with pH. So they kind of have some, they have a lot of similarities. We go below this neutral point, we're calling it an increase in its stronger oxidizing capabilities. If we go north, if we go to the right of this zero millivolts, we call it an increase in the reducing capabilities, so it's more strongly reducing agent. Here's another scale for you of just everyday common household items. So again, just like pH, you know, you have things, Coca-Cola, it's got a pH of two, so it's considered technically acidic. Um, the same thing, but it's a millivolt value, its ORP value is only 400 millivolts. So every day different items around have ORP um, values associated with them as well. So what's the working principle that's going on on a noble metal and a reference system that's in there, okay? Look at the reaction of acid permanganate solution. It's something that we call that strongly oxidizing. It strongly att attracts the electrons from the metal, that noble metal, the electrode. So it's highly positive, got a millivolt value that's generated. The opposite, the sulfite reaction, is strongly reducing. So it has pushes kind of those, ion, those activities, those ions, in, the electrons, I mean, into the metal and it generates a positive millivolt or a negative millivolt. So it's what we call strongly, strongly negative. It's uh, strongly reducing. Same in who reference we have that silver silver chloride pin immersed in a KCL solution with some junction that's open to the process and that combination is a zero millivolt value so then we're able to um, determine and read just the millivolt value that goes that is happening on that noble metal and get the actual millivolt reading the ORP value <coughs> sorry about that guys so like I said, in the electric circuit of it, it's a lot less complicated than the pH electric circuit, okay? We have the e, E2 and E3, that's our, you know, our reference pin over there on the right-hand side, that's going to be zero. That E3 is plugged, the junction's plugged or coded, that'll increase, which will change, obviously, to the equation and give us readings. But that E1 is what we're actually measuring, that the millivolt value, the voltages that's generated on that platinum pin. And obviously, you would do want a good solution ground still, just like with pH. But remember how I said that since um, the ORP electrode is not like pH, where it's not ion selective just for the hydrogen ion activity. It measures anything in the process. There are some applications that, like I said, will change millivolt reading because we're also having to change the pH of our process at the same time. So we need to make sure that we're compensating for those if we um, have those uh, types of situations. So the graph here is just kind of an example of what we've seen where with pH values, a process pH value changing also causing drastic changes in our, P, our ORP. So what happens is if there's a process this is, that this is occurring that they may not realize or staff has changed and this hasn't been shared, they're going to say, okay, well, my ORP value should be maintained at X, but every time this pump comes on, it changes and it goes to Y. Well, it comes, questions come calling in, and we have to figure out what's going on, and it, sometimes it does come back to, okay, well, your, your value is going at correlation to your pH change. One of the things that people can do to compensate this is they will measure pH because they're having to measure that pH to maintain it, but they will do a whole different system for ORP, and what they'll do is instead of having a silver-silver chloride reference element, 
they will actually use a pH measuring glass electrode because remember it's got holes in it that um, are only meant for hydrogen ions so it's actually a hydrogen ion elect measuring electrode so they'll use that as its reference background and then it'll have the uh, the platinum the noble metal platinum pin for ORP so this way if your pH changes that pH measuring glass that's your background will ride up on top of that pH change. So that's one of the ways that we can compensate for this. So when we do this, this is what we call pH compensated ORP. Some common places where we have seen where this effect happens in people, this is how they measure it, is um, in beer and the basically protection against the oxidation. They'll do it in the beer processes, beer manufacturing, breweries, um, tap water, You'll see it there. Dechlorination is a big one. Chlorination, boiler feed water. Um, so basically, these are applications where it might be beneficial to use the pH glass as a reference instead of a traditional reference. That way we know the millivolt values that we are seeing are because of the oxidation redu reduction or whatever chemical we're trying to um, put in to maintain at a certain process. So normally that's the level in which the theory that we go. Any deeper than that, it kind of gets a little, um, get a little more complicated than what people actually want. So let's get to what you can benefit from, okay? A traditional RP loop is exactly like your pH system that you have right now. You have some sort of analyzer, you have some cable, and you either have two or three individual electrodes and then they go into some flow fitting normally or you have it all in one because some sensors do have the capability of measuring pH and ORP at the same time. However, if we do that and we're in one of those processes that we have to do pH compensated ORP, you don't have the capability of measuring using your pH measuring glass as a true pH electrode and also a reference at the same time. So we need to make sure that we're choosing the right setup for the right type of application. So again, I said it on the one slide, we've got separate electrodes, we got combined all in one, and then we do have the newer technologies that are coming out, the differential um, type of reference systems that do, some of them do have the capability of doing ORP with them as well. So again, just the 12 millimeter, you guys should be aware of or have seen these in the past, they go into some sort of fitting, whether it's directly into a T or it goes into a flow fitting where you with a bypass line and then the all-in-one. These are common, kind of everybody makes them nowadays. So here's the measuring electrode. Um, again, most commonly used now is platinum, but there are some applications where um, a gold will be preferred because there's a, a I guess a, um, how do I call it? Um, an effect that can occur that basically, I'm going to refresh my notes real quick so I don't state it wrong, but um, the, it has an effect called chemiosorption. I always pronounce it wrong, so I had to pull out my spelling of it. Um, basically, we're strongly oxidizing solutions. They have oxygen actually bonds to the surface of the noble metal. So in those types of applications that can actually bond with a noble metal, you are kind of essentially same thing, plugging your reference junction. You're plugging your platinum measuring electrode. So in some cases, gold will be beneficial, but normally most manufacturers have standardized on the platinum element. Okay? Typical problems that you're going to see most common with ORP are going to just be coating of that platinum metal over time with like buildup of the process. And then obviously over time it will corrode. So if we pick, if we do have an application that, um, you know, reacts with um, gold or reacts with the other, uh, with platinum, you know, we may need to make sure we have the right metal in the process. I think the same thing goes with any, um, same piping in your plant. This is the biggest one as well. Your reference is traditionally the same pH reference that you have. So any problems, if you have a pH electrode and an ORP electrode in the same line because you just have two different measurements, you're going to have the same problems. So we need to make sure that we have the right junction. We need to make sure we have the right reference, like uh, internal fill solution, and we have proper cleaning going on with it as well. And this is where, remember, we talked about this briefly in, with the pH. 
developers, manufacturers have come out with those different types of junctions with ceramic. There's Teflon and there's sleeve for the different applications. So if we're measuring ORP in just a general purpose, you know, or like a batch neutralization, you can normally get away with either Teflon or ceramic. But if we're going into really nasty, dirty applications or ultra pure water, you're going to want a sleeve type junction, okay? To get the, this is just so you can get the longer or longest life out of your electrodes as possible. Same thing, you can either have a single junction, a double junction, or a triple junction. So um, depending on, again, how long you want to get how of life of your probe, because remember, your process attacks your first junction, and then it can go right up and ch connect your, uh, attack your reference pin. But if you've got a double junction, the process has to get through two different junctions. Same thing, obviously, with a three. It's got to get through three before it can get to your reference electrode. So if we're in ultra pure water, most commonly what you're going to see are what we call flowing type junctions. This means because the process is essentially pure water, there's no ions in there, we need to still make the continuity. So we'll have one that's open to the process that will allow a complete continuity to create complete that measuring circuit between the ORP electrode and the reference to give our ORP value. Um, in other applications that are uh, more aggressive, um, this salt bridge, remember this is another one that could be uh, utilized as well as to elongate that life of your reference. So remember, any problems that you have with your pH reference, you're going to have with your ORP reference. So the coating and plugging, we need to make sure we keep it clean. The actual process uh, poisoning the reference element can happen. So that's where getting the double, the triple, or even the salt bridge where you've got the long KCL chamber that has to be poisoned before your reference pin can get poisoned. And then stray currents. Just because it's an ORP, it's a metal measuring something, your reference electrode is still the same. So it's the path of least resistance. So if there's any noise, a pump turns on and it doesn't and have good grounding in the pipes or we're in plastic pipes without proper grounding, you're going to go right up through your reference pin and it's going to do uh, cause drifting in your ORP measurements as well. So we need to make sure that we um, correct for that as well. And then same thing, if we're in higher temperatures, we want to make sure that internal KCL solution that we choose or the probe that we pick that has um, that for higher temperatures, we want to make sure that it is um, thickened KCL, you know, salt. Um, but for the most time, if you're on like an RO skid, all of those are going to be some, done through a sample cooler where they're going to be cooled down to room temperature, so it's not necessarily a big problem. So that is the high level of the um, theory and the selections of electrodes. This is the fun part, the maintenance and calibration. Remember, again, I can't you know, um, say it enough, but everybody knows that calibrations and validation are different. And if we don't have good cleaning, we're not going to have good calibration. So we just need to make sure that we always start with cleaning them. So here's our known best practices and what we recommend our customers to do for their ORP and how to maintain them. So we always tell you to clean your electrodes first. Use fresh buffer solutions. Never keep ORP calibration solutions more than two hours. Um, they're not stable. Um, they can get contaminated very quickly. And then also pick an ORP solution that is closest to your control point because a lot of times we do just one point process cals. I mean not one point process cals, just one point calibrations. You can do two points but traditionally, historically, the method's just been a one point. So pick one that is closest to your measuring value. And then always out allow for stable time, okay? Um, don't use grab samples if you can avoid it because if you always grab sample to your process you're comparing that grab sample to a lab but you don't actually have a third party independent to say was your handheld lab meter that you used accurate so when we start to drift on with our online meter we start to play the who's right who's wrong so if we can use known solutions um, that's the best practice okay and then obviously the frequency um, uh, is just going to depend on how accurate you want and how you, to your ORP measurement to be. So cleaning, this is what we recommend. You're going to rinse it. 
Um, traditionally, you can use HCl, but we've seen that um, nitric acid actually works better, but you can use methanol, you can use um, like a Dawn detergent if you've got an oily substance or organics in there that are coating or that are causing coating. But whatever you use after you clean it, you want to make sure that you soak it for at least 30 minutes prior to actually doing your calibration. And a lot of people don't do this. But if we stick it in something that's really strong, that's actually itself could be considered an oxidizing or um, a reducing agent, and we've just put all of that on our metal pen, we haven't given our metal platinum time to soak all that off so that it is... Um, you know, able to be a p accurate calibration. So we're building in errors if we don't make sure that we uh, let it uh, soak for a little bit, okay? Um, with us, just with pH, we say if it's within 0.03 pH, you really don't have to calibrate it again. The same thing with ORP, this is where some of the discrepancies come in, is it's really honestly only accurate within a plus or minus 30 millivolt range. So if you're within plus or minus 30 millivolts, you really can just put it back on. You don't have to calibrate unless your SOP says you have to calibrate, then you have to calibrate. There are some times where the processes can be, the platinum pins can be um, kind of refurbished, for lack of better words. I don't see a lot of people actually doing this, but you can refurbish it with like uh, emery board. You're basically just, anything that was adhered to it, you're, cut, you're kind of scraping it all off. But if you do that, again, just make sure you have enough time for the platinum pen or the gold pen to um, reacclimate. All right, so common calibration methods. Forgot to take out the um, little click throughs, so animations, so give me a moment. So there are two different types of calibration. There's a manual calibration, and it's either a zero, which is a one point calibration, or a two point, which gives you a zero and a slope. Um, traditionally, because it's just a platinum measuring pen, your reference, there's no need to do a slope because there's no pH glass that's being aged that you need to compensate for. So traditionally, we do a one point manual cal. You can do a grab sample cal if you want to, um, but if you do that, we just make sure that Obviously, anything you do, obviously, sample cal is going to be what your process ORP value is, but make sure you, again, pick a solution that is close to your ORP value, your measuring ORP value. So we just say you're going to clean your probe. You're going to rinse it really well. You're going to make a fresh buffer. This is either done historically with uh, your pH buffer solutions. You mix in some quinhydrone and you allow it to um, kind of you put a little bit in, stir it in. If it dissolves all the way, you put a little bit more, stir it in. Um, that is traditionally and historically what people have done. Otherwise, you can get pre-made or packets that you can open up and single-use packets and make the solution up, okay? Um, but be sure you make them fresh and give plenty of time to stabilize. And then if you do do your second point, rinse it thoroughly in between the two points. So, like I said, this is most common. Pre-made solutions and quinhydrone solutions are what people traditionally use now. They used to have a light solution mixture, but because of some toxicity to it, um, it's not good practice to use it anymore, so you don't really see that out in the field there anymore. But basically, with the quinhydrone solution, there's known values out there where if I stick a quinhydrone in my four and my seven pH technical buffers that I have, and I use it at a certain temperature, um, or measure at a certain temperature, that this combination has a known millivolt value. So this is traditionally what people have used in the past. However, more and more people are going to these pre-made solutions. Um, the label here is Hamilton, and that is great, and that is fine, and we actually prefer those, because with this one, I know it's going to be 475. If it is within its shelf life and if it has been properly maintained, meaning you took a sample, you used it, when you used it, you threw it away, you didn't pour it back in the bottle, so we're not recontaminating it, we know it's going to be 475. So it's a good buffer to go between our lab measurement and our online process when we get into that who's right, who's wrong kind of thing. The thing that people don't understand or what they don't pay attention to is that there's two values on this label. Some people, some of you guys may have already picked it out. But we have to be aware 
when we use pre-made solutions what the reference background is in it because this if I use a probe that has KCL and KCL solution which is what traditionally they are um, it's going to be 475 but if I use like a the original standard hydrogen electron it's going to actually be 680 instead of 475 and this is the biggest common discrepancy that we run into when people say well the label says it should be you know 300 but I stick it online and it's 270 so what have been developed over time and kind of started to be or they've been used are again some charts that the different manufacturers over the years have put together that say okay if I have an ORP solution that was made from a one molar KCL solution okay and my electrode that I am using is actually a three molar KCL solution that internal fill solution of that reference of that PA or that ORP electrode I'm not going to read 350 millivolts like this bottle says I should read I'm actually going to read 372 millivolts because there's a difference just because of the reference in the what the um, what the ORP solutions were made with and what are is in your actual um, measuring system that you have online so we run into this a lot when people call and say I've got a discrepancy so we just need to know your ORP solution what is it made with what's in our probe that we have because sometimes if you look remember the average is within plus or minus 30 millivolts the you know the discrepancy if you have a saturated KCL high temperature ORP probe that should have saturated KCL in it it could be your 30 millivolt difference right there okay so we just need to be aware of this and it's just educating to you know always think about this it may not be the first thing I come to I may have to circle back around to it but quite frequently this is when we get down to it this is normally where the discrepancies come so this you have in the um, handouts when you get it the ORP quick guide for you guys on I mean troubleshooting tips for ORP what we have seen if you're if you describe what you're seeing as slow on slow responses this was is our recommendations for you guys to what you can look at it doesn't matter whose equipment okay so here I think I've got a little bit of time I think we're at the 30 minute mark um, I'm gonna go over some question some um, common applications that we have seen okay bioside control is a big one this is where we actually monitor the ORP value and we relate that back to how much um, um, how much free chlorine is in like the cooling tower is where I've seen it however in your cooling tower you really are also maintaining your pH of your cooling tower so this is one that we do have to use instead of a traditional reference we use a pH measuring glass so we will have actually two independent loops even if we have a sensor that can measure pH and ORP at the same time we will have one sensor that's set up with a traditional reference and the pH glass measuring pH and then we will have the exact same setup with actually using the pH measuring glass as our reference against that noble metal to give us our ORP value and then this way whenever I change my pH in my cooling tower I know that the millivolt value that I'm seeing because of my chlorine concentration is honestly because of the chlorine concentration not because of a millivolt value associated with the pH change so again that chart that we referenced before this is just common what we've seen another one that we have um, seen ORP is water disinfectant similar to Bioside control ORP can be used um, in the disinfection of the water. It's normally a critical step in minimizing the uh, like potential transmission of different pathogens. So studies have been done that determine that if I maintain at a certain ORP value at X amount of time, then certain pathogens are killed off. Um, so we see this in not just drinking water purification systems but also for um, like industrial um, washing machines they'll use it for disinfection in their water sample there as well this is one that I've come across in searching with uh, on ORP um, I have myself have not seen it um, but apparently 
ORP value is somehow correlated to your ozone concentration in your water samples as well. So this one is one that's out there. I don't know a lot about this one. Like I said, I've just seen it um, in researching some studies and um, technical papers that have been written um, that have been submitted to different chemistry um, uh, show uh, the symposiums and stuff like that. One that is the hot topic that's been a hot topic for about three years now is this MATS, this mercury and toxic standards. Um, the idea is that if I have a scrubber and I'm measuring pH already normally, but the idea is if I also maintain a certain ORP value, it tells me that I have X amount of mercury that I'm emitting out of my stack. Um, so there are, in the EPA regulations that have come out, again, there are certain values in which the, has, the ORP value has to be maintained, and that equals so much mercury that you're outputting. So this is like the biggest hot topic, like I said, for about the two, past two or three years. Another one that, um, not as fascinating in the, I guess, necessarily the water treatment world, but, um, you know, indigo dyeing. It's an oxidation reduction, so how long or how strong this reaction goes on will determine how dark our genes are. And then another one, bigger one, the two most crucial ones um, that could cause more harm than good is if we have an, um, the electrode plating wastewater plants. Um, we have toxic chromium and toxic cyanide. So these go through a two-stage um, ORP reaction that has to happen to reduce the um, state from to the form that we can actually output into our wastewater without causing um, harm to our environment and ourselves. Um, a couple others that we have here. Um, this is a lot shorter presentation than when it comes to pH because it's just so new, not new, but less known. We don't want to overpower or like over numb you with just power, death by PowerPoint. Um, but basically magnesium, um, Refining of copper, silver, nickel, tin, all those are ORP, uh, ORP electrodes. And then besides, even in the electroplating applications, besides the chromium and the cyanide reduction within the process itself, they have ORP measurements that they have to maintain the baths and they have to uh, maintain at certain ORP values for a certain amount of time. So those are the most common that um, I have seen or found, like I said, that ozone one was new to me. Um, over the past nine years here. So we briefly went over ORP, how to measure it, what kind of common equipment that we're going to have, how is it different than our pH. Um, our best practice for your cleaning and calibrating and where we see the most discrepancies occur. Hopefully I explained that um, well enough for you guys. And then typically known applications. So I should be at the 35 minute mark now, so I'm going to open it up for um, Q&A at this time. Hi everybody, this is David Paul again. Thank you so much, Sherlyn. A very interesting presentation. So now um, if you haven't written your questions to Sherlyn, please do so. And now Sherlyn will be a, uh, giving a question, so she'll uh, say the question and then give the answer. And we've got about 15 minutes uh, of Q&A. If we run out of questions, then we'll just end. Um, if we have more questions than we can cover, then again, you'll be answered by email, and we'll also put the question and answer on the recorded webinar. So again, here's Sherlyn to answer your questions. Yeah, and also to add to that, you know, process analyzers is an always changing world in learning. So if I don't know your answer, I will be honest and tell you I actually don't know the answer right now, but I will always find an answer, and I'll get your email from David and them, and we'll make sure that you get an answer within the next week easily. So our first question here is, what is the relation millivolt to ppm? 
Okay, well, this is going to be um, dependent on the chemical in which you're referencing. So, like the known chart that I have right now at my hand is for those chlorines, right? So, if you've got an ORP value of about, you know, 800 to 825 millivolt, or millivolt value, that's what's generated on the um, analyzer display, that would be equivalent to, say, about a 5 to 6, uh, about a 4 to 5 ppm range, if I'm reading this chart correctly. It's a little small, so I have to zoom in on it. So it's going to differ from what we're looking at, but there are value charts out there that we can get. How come in every stream I have the ORP goes up with oxidizers just as the pH potential increases with acidity where you stated the opposite? And that is actually, I have looked at that multiple, multiple times because every time I go over this, it sounds so backwards. And um, it actually is that, the, ox the reducing, the oxidizing agent causes a reduction. I always just, I'm not going to say it wrong, so I want to look it up. And I may have put it backwards on the chart. My little cheat sheet of the ORP scale that I made may have been wrong. So that mark question, Daryl, if you can flag it, I actually want to verify that. But the oxidation agent is actually causing a reduction, which should be a positive value, not a negative value. So I just want to dig into that some more and make sure that what I just stated wasn't wrong. Okay. So we have 0 0.005 ppm of free chlorine but 1 ppm of um, bisulfide, but ORP is reading 350 millivolts, pH is 7. Can you please help explain why we have strong positive ORP reading while the sulfite concentration is much higher than the oxidizer? This is what I was actually kind of concerned about. That's a chemistry question, the details that um, that one I'll have to get back with you on because I don't want to I don't want to state it wrong. ORP topic is a little it's not new, but from that side of it I don't want to state wrong. I want to make sure we get you the right answer so I can get the right person in contact with you. Okay. Next question is should we do calibration on ORP? We have a brand new ORP, and when measuring 200 millivolts, the standard calibration solution, it reads 250. Should we or should we not calibrate? Um, like I said, within we say it's 30 millivolts, so that's outside of that range. So yes, that's 50 millivolts. It would be good practice to um, calibrate. Another thing I forgot to mention when we were talking about calibration is if you are using a combination electrode that measures pH and ORP at the same time and you do a pH calibration, you need to make sure that you check with whoever the electronic supplier is because I know in our electronics, the zero, the first calibration point that you do that would be associated with your ORP value, your zero offset, that is in, in calibrations. So um, I forgot to mention that, so I just want to mention that here. But for this particular question as well is yes, make sure you do calibrate that. Okay, I'm looking. Okay, next question here is what would be the indicator probe for a system measuring ORP in the negative 300 to negative 375 range with high chlorides measuring biological reduction and high chloride solution. Um, there you're going to need a reference that is at least probably a double junction um, for one if you're going to use traditional reference but I would be interested if where you are if you're also going to maybe need to do the pH compensated ORP to make sure that the millivolt value is due to um, what says high chlorides yeah so chloride solution yeah if you just have a double junction reference electro traditional KCL, then that would be okay. Alrighty, next question is, we have two 
ORP probes with the same manufacturer brain but different models. The two probes read 100 millivolts in difference and highly positive. How do we determine which ORP we should be selecting? This is the fun part because we have to start to isolate them from each other. So we have to look at, okay, um, if you take your ORP probes, assuming they are easily quick detachable cables, because if I tell you to whole swap a whole cable, you may get angry and have to not want to run the cable, especially with the long distance. But if you have a quick disconnect, simply swap the probes and see if that one that was 100 millivolts higher than the other one, see if it stayed with the transmitter or if it stayed with the sensor. If it went with the sensor, then I would start to look at that particular sensor that it followed. If it stayed with the transmitter, then we need to look at the age of that transmitter, look at the cable on that transmitter and see what's going on because it, it's probably not the, um, it's something in the instrumentation that's causing the offset. Um, I have a question about how high of temperature can we go? That question is going to depend on whose sensor that you use. Um, some sensors can only measure up to 105C, so 221F. Other sensors can go up all the way to 130C, and I think it correlates back to either 280F or maybe it could be 3F. Um, getting up there going from Celsius to Fahrenheit, I don't know the calculations off the top of my head. So it depends on the equipment that you have, depending on how high you can go. How, uh, about how much time should we allow for stabilization time? Um, depending on if you're in your solution, if you have cleaned it with something that's strongly oxidizing or strongly reducing, that 30 minute window is a good rule of thumb. If you've done that and then you put it in your ORP solution, um, I would say no more than two to five minutes is probably what's needed for an ORP electrode unless we haven't cleaned it. Over that, we're going to probably need to clean it because these should be a lot quicker um, calibrations than what we see with pH because it's, it's just a piece of metal. Can ORP be used in corrosion monitoring program? This is actually something that, um, yes, it can be done. I, from my standpoint, I can't tell you what the millivolt value is you're going to have to maintain it at. So someone there somewhere has probably done, you know, some investigation to it. I can tell you that EPRI has done some investigation, but it's not been, as far as what I've seen, it's not been finished. They've done it on, like, copper pipes. Um, they do what they call ECP, electrochemical potential, but all it is is using a standard you know, reference, that KCL reference, and instead of a platinum or gold, it's actually using a copper pin. So it's the idea, and it's uh, idea is you use a metal pin that is the same process pipe, and then that will corrode away and generate some millivolt value. And um, and if you maintain a certain millivolt value, you know, you get the longest life out of it. So it's an ORP measurement, but they just call, they refer to it as ECP. So you may want to look into um, that if you're looking at what you want more information about corrosion monitoring. Alrighty. Um, got a question here. What would white powder deposited on an ORP probe indicate? Um, need more information on where you mean white powder. Uh, if you're using a combination electrode and you take the white, the wet boot off of it and there's white powder on the body of the probe, that's just the internal KCL salt solution that has dried out and crystallized would be my guess. Okay. Next question is, what patterns do you use to calibrate? Not sure what you mean by what patterns do you use to calibrate. Can we get a little more clarification on that question, please? Okay, we'll come back to that one, um, whoever asked that. 
if you're asking about patterns as in do I do pH or recalibration, that's my recommendation if you're using a combination and you're measuring both at the same time simultaneously, do the pH calibration first, then do that one point, pro, uh, one point ORP calibration. All right, we got a next question here is, do you have any idea about hydrogen peroxide in regard to ORP? Yes, we have history with it, and um, what more in particular are you asking about? Okay, so next question here is, we have ORP probes with white wet, not hard material coming out of the ORP junction. We think this is messing with our readings. Do you know why this might be happening? Um, yeah, my guess is it's the KCL solution that's coming from the inside of the probe out, and then it's reacting um, at, the, at the point with your process. Um, which is more healthy, the water with ORP positive or ORP negative? That one is beyond my knowledge, um, so that one I would, you know, have to look into for you and or refer back to someone like David who's got more experience with RO skids and, you know, helping evaluate those. Okay. Um, what is the typical ORP range that is desired for protecting RO membranes while minimizing biofouling potential? That is one as well from where I standpoint. I don't normally tell customers the ranges, so we can find that for you and get that back to you easily because I'm sure David's group has a lot of experience with what they've seen and what they've helped people with before. Okay, we got one more question here. It says, what is the typical ORP range? Oop, hold on. Give me a second. The chat window just jumped up on me. Um, what is the typical ORP range that is desired for protecting RO membranes while minimizing bio biofouling potential? Um, are there types of probes that shouldn't be calibrated? The manufacturer says not to calibrate. Okay, so the first part of this, because it was multiple questions, is the same thing as the previous question. So, again, um, people like David's group have that information that can definitely give you from what they have seen over the years and where um, what where to maintain it good so that you don't have the um, damage to the membranes. Um, if you have a manufacturer that's telling you that you don't need to calibrate your ORP probe, I think that's honestly a little crazy and ridiculous. Um, if it's my company, please give me a call and let me know so that I can correct my support staff. But you have an ORP that is open to your process. If you don't correct for the plugging and coating that's happening, that yes, you're gonna be cleaning it, but if you're not also considering that, you're not gonna get accurate reading, so it wouldn't be far off for you to be off, okay? So yes, calibrate. Um, there's one question, this one's the last question, is are there Oh, there's two questions here. I guess they came in late. So are there types of probes that shouldn't be calibrated? Oh, same one. I'm sorry. We just answered that. Um, last question is, is there any application for ORP in moisty air to measure certain contaminants? That one would be a new one for me. So um, I can look at it for you if you want me to do some investigating and ask some of my counterparts if they have seen something similar and get their feedback. I can easily ask around, you know, and see what we can find for you. So there were a few that are outside my knowledge, so I will make sure that we get you answers to those guys. Thanks, Sherlyn, and thanks everybody for your questions. Um, so we're right here at the end. I'll just mention that you have to do a little trial and error to determine at your plant where your what the ORP value is going to be 
where you get zero chlorine and just a half to one part per million of excess sulfate. So it's not something where we could just tell you an exact millivolt because it's going gonna, it's gonna to depend on um, some things at your plant. So let's uh, just wrap up. Um, thank you so much for attending. We have lots of different training and we go over a lot of things like um, how to uh, come up with the uh, millivolt reading. Uh, so if there's anything that we can do for you as far as the training in, we would love to work with you. We also have um, technical services where we may be of value. So thanks so much for attending. If you wouldn't mind, as you're exiting, there's just three polling questions. It really doesn't take any time, but it gives us some feedback on how satisfied you are with this webinar. Thanks so much. See you next one. Bye-bye.